Deus Ex is a game that basically defines cult classic, with a small dedicated following and an influence that far exceeds its lack of commercial success. It's a game that, for many, represents the pinnacle of a particular school of game design, one that prizes immersion, choice, rich world building, cool trench coat dudes, and lots and lots of air ducts. Now we're on the cusp of the release of the fourth game in the series, Mankind Divided, which seems like a good time to take a look back at this storied franchise, one that has somehow survived and even thrived to this day despite middling sales, an uneven sequel, years of dormancy, and a name that nobody can pronounce. Deus Ex 3, Deus Ex 3, Deus Ex. Welcome to Ludodrum. I'm Nate Behrens, and this is a brief history of where I read the Wikipedia article all the way through, so you don't have to. When tracing a game's influences, it can be tricky to know exactly where to stop, yet in the case of Deus Ex, there is a strong and consistent through line that can be traced through the early 90s, when the first inkling of the immersive simulation genre was little more than an ambitious design document on the hard drive of an Origin Systems programmer. Paul Neurath wasn't happy with the way that his previous game, Space Rogue, split itself between its top-down role-playing segments and simulation-style space dogfights. He envisioned a game that smoothed out the seams, bringing together RPG and sim elements into a single immersive experience. He wrote up a design doc for a game called Underworld that would be as much a dungeon simulator as it was a role-playing game. And soon he left Origin to form his own studio, Blue Sky Productions. His team included programmer Doug Church and, towards the end of the project, producer Warren Spector. Ties with Origin were hardly severed, as they agreed to publish the game, and even suggested attaching the beloved Ultima license to the Underworld concept. Development started in earnest in 1991. Published months before Wolfenstein 3D, Ultima Underworld featured groundbreaking 3D techniques, using a raycasting engine to create a realistic 3D world, with a fully texture-mapped environment and smooth movement. Previous first-person dungeon crawlers had relied on more abstract grid-based movement and wireframe graphics. What really set Underworld apart, though, was the complexity of its world. The Stygian Abyss was a massive, non-linear dungeon full of systems and details that existed primarily to immerse the player. Torches could be pulled from the wall and carried as a personal light source, or dropped on the ground. Players could run, jump, and swim. They could engage in melee combat, use magic, or sneak past encounters. Characters had to rest and eat to recover health and stamina, and items could be combined in unique ways, such as creating popcorn by combining a torch and corn in one's inventory. Ultima Underworld was released in 1992 to massive critical acclaim, and slowly built up impressive sales numbers after enthusiastic word of mouth spread. After the release of Ultima Underworld, Blue Sky Productions changed its name to Looking Glass Studios and worked on a well-received sequel. Looking Glass set their sights on a different setting for their follow-up project. Burnt out on the swords and sorcery of fantasy role-playing games, they went in the opposite direction. System Shock was a futuristic, cyberpunk take on the immersive simulation, one that added a strong horror element. Doug Church, the programmer on Ultima Underworld, directed the project this time around, though Paul Neurath and Warren Spector remained heavily involved. In System Shock, players control a hacker waking from a coma to find himself trapped on board the Citadel space station, which has fallen under the control of a rogue homicidal AI named Shodan. System Shock built on the Ultima Underworld framework, adding more complex architecture, movement controls like leaning and crouching, and an array of attachable implants and hardware that gave the player abilities like regenerating health at the expense of detrimental side effects. Once again, players were given free reign to explore the station using a vast palette of tools. Gas grenades, EMP weapons, body armor, tranquilizer darts, rocket launchers, and more. Freedom of choice was paramount, and combat was designed to be approachable from a number of different angles. Rather than using the dialogue trees of Underworld, System Shock pioneered a narrative technique inspired by Edgar Lee Masters' Spoon River Anthology, a poetry collection of fictional epitaphs of characters from the same town. 
In that same vein, System Shock's narrative and backstory were delivered via in-game audio logs and emails scattered around the abandoned station. Welcome back to Citadel Station. We hope your somnolent healing stage went well. We got the supplies from the West Wing. Hanson and Rain killed by mutants nesting the access corridor. These small snippets of dialogue implied a greater world beyond the player's immediate experience and contributed to the sense of isolation, as throughout the game, the hacker never comes into direct contact with another living person. Once again, System Shock was massively acclaimed. Though lacking a famous license such as Ultima, it sold far fewer copies and ended up as a loss for Looking Glass. Even so, it helped set in stone many of the elements of immersive sim design that are now so common as to feel cliché. The DNA of everything from Bioshock and Dead Space to Soma and even Gone Home can be traced here. Around this time, Warren Spector developed a pitch for a game set in the modern day called Troubleshooter, inspired by action movies like Die Hard and Under Siege. It would be a mission-based immersive sim in which each mission was a richly developed scenario that could be approached in a number of ways. The design doc describes it as follows. You scope out the situation, checking maps and photos, walking around the site, probing for the best way in, the way that will put the fewest innocent people at risk. You try to talk a madman into surrendering before he blows himself and his hostages to kingdom come. You crawl through air ducts and sewers hoping you don't attract the attention of the bad guys with all the guns. You shoot it out with terrorists wielding enough firepower to take on a third world army. Spectre's pitch was never approved, and the idea was shelved, but it's not difficult to see the seeds of his later work on Deus Ex in that description. In 1995, Looking Glass hired Ken Levine and gave him the task of developing pitches for the studio's next game alongside Doug Church. One of the pitches was for a medieval action RPG called Dark Camelot that would invert Arthurian legend, casting King Arthur as an evil tyrant alongside a psychopathic Merlin. Dark Camelot reached the prototyping phase, and Levine and Church experimented with a number of gameplay styles, with the intention of allowing the player to choose between melee combat, magic, and stealth, but it was at Paul Neurath's suggestion that they finally focused on and developed one particular set of mechanics, namely the stealth. Soon, the project had been retitled The Dark Project, with the focus squarely on its stealth gameplay. With this focus, they also moved away from the Arthurian legends and developed an original steampunk setting. Aside from the innovative focus on stealth gameplay, which at the time was nearly unheard of, Thief's major contribution to the immersive sim genre was the move to full 3D, which allowed for more complex physics and simulated interactions. Project lead Greg Lopiccolo described their goals. Quote, Essentially we're building a type of simulator, where object interactions are correct and physics are tied in correctly. End quote. Light, shadow, sound, and physics are all important gameplay elements. Protagonist Garrett is armed with water arrows, for example that can put out torches, extinguishing light sources, and allowing him to sneak through the darkness. Level design as well was more expansive and open-ended than Ultima or System Shock. Many levels included massive, multi-story buildings, or even entire neighborhoods, allowing players to approach their objectives from numerous angles while employing a variety of strategies. Before the game was finished, budget cuts forced the closure of Looking Glass's Austin branch many of whose developers were snatched up by John Romero's slick new startup, Ion Storm. While Romero headed up the studio's Dallas branch, Warren Spector was hired to lead a separate team out of Austin. Spector has said that he had little to do with the development of Thief, having left while it was still in production, yet it's clear that he took significant inspiration from it into his future projects. Thief the Dark Project was released to glowing reviews, and went on to become Looking Glass's best-selling game. Look at you, hacker. A p -p pathetic creature of meat and bone. Ken Levine also left Looking Glass to form his own studio in Boston. Irrational Studios' first project was developing a sequel to System Shock that, despite being developed completely separately and at roughly the same time, shares perhaps more design DNA with Deus Ex than any other game. Built on the Thief engine, System Shock 2 took the sci-fi horror of the first game into a deeply atmospheric, fully 3D environment with a far heavier emphasis on RPG-style progression. 
players could choose between three different classes, each with different starting stats, that focused on weaponry, psionics, and hacking, respectively. Cyber modules collected throughout the game allowed players to upgrade those stats, but these were in short supply, forcing players to specialize. Without the ability to max out all of their skills, players had to strategize where to place their points. Did they want to tackle enemies head-on, guns blazing? Or did they want to hack their way through alternate routes, avoiding as much combat as possible? Or did they want to use psionic abilities like invisibility or teleportation? The game also included an RPG-style inventory system, like XCOM or Diablo, that required players to make tough choices about which items to hold on to, which to use immediately, and which to throw away. System Shock 2 primarily took place in the constrained, claustrophobic halls of the spaceship Von Braun, and therefore lacked the sprawling, multi-layered level design that Deus Ex would be known for, but its interface and skill system are nearly identical, and clearly inspired the team at Ion Storm. System Shock 2 went on to, you guessed it, critical acclaim, but underwhelming sales, and it would be nearly a decade before Levine would have a bona fide hit with its spiritual successor, Bioshock, but that's a different story. Before System Shock 2 was released, Ion Storm had already begun pre-production on its debut title. With Romero's promise of total creative freedom and a sizable budget, Warren Spector was free to finally pursue his dream game. He'd written a manifesto of sorts describing his vision and rules for RPG design. Always show the goal. Problems, not puzzles. There should always be more than one way to get past a game obstacle. Always. No forced failure. Role-playing is about interacting with other people in a variety of ways, not just combat, not just conversation. Constant rewards will drive the players onward. Think 3D. If there's no need to look up and down constantly, make a 2D game. With these guidelines in mind, Spectre had a chance to create the game that had been on his mind for years, the game that would embody all of his ideas and dreams for the ultimate role-playing game. Spectre went back to his now years-old concept for Troubleshooter, the modern-day action movie-inspired RPG, but decided that the real world was too restrictive for compelling RPG gameplay. He and lead designer Harvey Smith drafted a new setting, one that moved to the future, near enough to the present to feel grounded and relatable, but far enough to allow them to fudge reality where they felt it was necessary. This futuristic setting was influenced by the Y2K-era paranoia and obsession with conspiracy theories that had permeated pop culture, after the X-Files and Men in Black became huge hits. Soon, they had drafted a design document for the awkwardly titled Shooter Majestic Revelations. Eh, names are hard, I guess. Even so, the document closely resembles what eventually became Deus Ex. Spectre and Smith did research into real-world conspiracy theories, and set about creating a world where nearly all of them were true where everything was controlled by shadowy elite cabals, and where the average man on the street was a hapless rube, ignorant of the apocalyptic machinations around him. They fleshed out hundreds of characters, and a fictional history stretching from the 1990s to the 2050s for the entire world. Much of this never made it on screen, but it provided important context for the writers and designers. Deus Ex has players taking control of the rookie bio-augmented counter-terrorist agent, J.C. Denton. Along with his brother Paul, JC works for the agency UNATCO to fight terrorism across the world, which isn't in great shape. A plague is ravaging cities across the globe, economic inequality is driving the lower classes to desperation, and terror attacks are rampant. Of course, it's not long before JC uncovers that his brother is a traitor to UNATCO, and is actually allied with the very enemies they've been fighting. Paul helps JC uncover the truth about UNATCO, the plague, and the people who are really pulling the strings. The game was a globe-hopping epic that took players to New York, Hong Kong, Paris, and Nevada, from the Statue of Liberty to open-air markets and dance clubs to underground research facilities. In Deus Ex, your choices mattered in ways big and small. Famously, you could walk into the women's bathroom in the UNACO headquarters and get shouted out by a distraught coworker for being a pervert. How unprofessional. A funny enough easter egg, but it comes back later when your boss chews you out for such blatant unprofessionalism. Stay out of the ladies' restroom. That kind of activity embarrasses the agency more than it does you. That may sound small today, but at the time it was revelatory. Major characters can live and die based on your actions, and there are multiple endings that encompass wildly different outcomes and ideologies. Looking back, 
The storytelling is hammy, and the presentation is pretty basic. Characters launch into lengthy philosophical and historical tangents with little prompting on a regular basis. There are all sorts of goofy elements, from literal men in black to the Illuminati that are treated with the gravest seriousness by people in ridiculous trench coats and sunglasses. The villains are cartoonishly evil, and JC himself is a bare-bones character with the personality of an ironing board. But it's all fun as hell to watch, and what was inspired by far-flung wild-eyed paranoia actually feels extraordinarily prescient in many ways. You'll get smart discussions of government overreach, extrajudicial killings, the use of propaganda, and the fragility of privacy in an always connected social media world. Not too shabby for a game where the main character wears sunglasses at night. Don't tell me you're going to wear those sunglasses during a night operation. My vision is augmented. But Deus Ex's real contribution to gaming is in its design. It combined the large open levels of Thief with the skill and inventory management of System Shock 2, all while iterating and improving on the core concepts of the immersive sim in a setting that allowed for bigger scope and greater variety. Deus Ex represents the best of both worlds, a rich setting and clever, engaging storytelling alongside open-ended gameplay that gives the players an incredible array of tools and systems to play with, and interesting obstacles to overcome however they wish. Players assign stat points to skills such as rifle combat, hacking, lockpicking, and the literally never useful swimming. Augmentations found throughout the game give unique abilities, much like they did in System Shock. Invisibility, regenerating health, and super speed, to name a few. Like System Shock 2, no one player can become a jack of all trades, so they're forced to specialize. Nearly every single moment of the game can be approached in multiple ways. The most obvious choice is between violence and stealth, but even then there are a multitude of smaller choices. Hang back and snipe from afar. Silence your footsteps and go for melee kills. Maybe you're a pacifist and you want to use non-lethal gas grenades, or screw it, throw explosive lambs and blow them all to pieces. Trying to get into a secure base? You could hack the doors and unlock them that way, or take the key off a body of the guard you just killed. The real answer is to always use the vents, but you're welcome to do the wrong thing too, such is the magic of Deus Ex. I know the bathroom is unisex, but just wait a minute, will you? The game was originally much, much larger in scope than what we eventually got to play, with hundreds of unique NPCs, several extra environments including the White House, post-earthquake Los Angeles, FEMA concentration camps with thousands of prisoners, and hell, even the moon. Spectre admits that they were blinded by promises of total creative freedom and a big budget, but it soon became clear that cuts were needed. Harvey Smith reworked the design document, and the number of locations and characters were significantly reduced to accommodate the limitations of both the Unreal Engine and the production schedule. Even so, Deus Ex felt huge in a way that few games at that time did. You could lose hours in a single area like Hell's Kitchen, poking and prodding at all the different nooks and crannies, delving into the secrets beneath the streets, or breaking into people's apartments. Sure, the graphics were middling even at release, and the shooting was clunky, the voice acting was either flat or over the top, and occasionally borderline racist. Rules of Trial Wars. Red Arrow versus Luminous Pack. But there was an unprecedented freedom that was exhilarating and a sense of genuine discovery as you peeled apart the game's secrets. It didn't invent its ideas whole cloth as we've seen, but it took the innovations of Blue Sky and Looking Glass and expanded upon them in momentous ways. Deus Ex is very much a product of its time, and anyone playing it for the first time had better prepare themselves for boxy architecture and clunky weapon handling, among other flaws. Yet it remains a watershed moment in game design, one whose influence can be seen in modern games from Assassin's Creed to Far Cry. It remains the feather in Ion Storm's cap after the schadenfreude-laden failure of Romero's own project Daikatana and the unfortunately ignored release of Tom Hull's Anachronix. There's a reason Deus Ex has its own meme, and if you'll excuse me, I have to stop recording now and go install it. Warren Spector has said he didn't expect Deus Ex to sell very well, but that it would be embraced by a niche crowd, and he was absolutely right. Deus Ex launched in June 2000 to ecstatic reviews, but sales were less enthusiastic. It did sell enough, however, to warrant a sequel. For the sequel to Deus Ex, Harvey Smith took the reins. This would be a very different beast than the original game. It would be developed using all new technology, and would be developed simultaneously for both PC and the original Xbox, in an era where PC and console games were essentially separate worlds. The game had to be designed to work within the constraints of the Xbox's tech, and this, as well as a desire to correct some of the original's flaws, guided much of the design. 
The game jumped ahead 20 years to the 2070s and attempted to present a world where, essentially, all three endings of the first game had taken place. Players took control of a new protagonist, Alex Denton. Uh, shit. Uh, Alex D. No relation. No relation. Alex is a trainee at the Tarsus Academy, training for security and counterterrorism work. After operatives from a global church called the Order attack, Alex escapes the facility and discovers that Tarsus is a front for biomodification experiments on its students. Soon, the player is introduced to the game's three factions, the Order, the World Trade Organization, and Apostle Corps. The game sends you from city to city, Seattle, Cairo, Trier, Antarctica, and New York, running missions for one or more of the factions, asking you to choose the lesser evil and helping that faction rise to power. This symmetry between the factions arose because of criticisms of the original game. Despite all of the freedom in Deus Ex 1, the game forced your hand when it came to choosing sides. JC had to betray Unatco and defect the NSF, and he had to battle Majestic 12 and Bob Page. Invisible War hoped to correct that by allowing players to choose their allegiances, but in doing so, it had to put each faction on a level playing field. This leads to each faction feeling just about equally corrupt, inflexible, and overall shitty. That's not to say the story is bad, it's actually the game's strength. There's plenty of sharp writing and social commentary that feels incisive even 13 years later. The holographic pop star who doubles as a data mining digital spy comes to mind, but it is difficult to feel any sort of attachment to the factions in the game when they are all deliberately, equally unlikable. The game's biggest failing was the attempt to simplify the game mechanics. It's here that the limitations of the technology and the desire to fix the first game are most apparent. Designing for a controller with a dozen buttons compared to a keyboard and mouse forced a radical rethinking of the augmentation and inventory systems, which led to decisions like unified ammo, where all weapons used the same single ammo source. Skills and augmentations were consolidated into biomods, and were reduced from the original's 11 skills in 9 aug slots to a measly 5 biomod slots. All inventory items occupied the same amount of space as opposed to the grid system of the original. The hacking interface was reduced from a simulated computer interface to a simple loading bar. I think what we did with Deus Ex was we listened to our super hardcore friends who told us, here's how I would fix Deus Ex. I mean, we listened, to, we had some friends, some good friends, who told us that Deus Ex was a giant disaster and here's what they would change. And I love those guys. And we really felt sensitive about that. We really felt like, God, we've, we've, uh, we're not meeting the demands or we're not meeting the standards of our very intelligent designer friends. So ashamed. Let's fix all that in the sequel. And we weren't listening to the players of the original game who liked what we had done. And so in trying to fix some of those things, uh, redundant things, like we had skills and augmentations that were overlapping and redundant. So we eliminated those. We boiled them all down into one system, which was easier on the console interface. It was easier to learn. Uh, but it didn't allow for certain combinations that even if they weren't mechanically interesting, they, they built a fantasy in the player's head. Like, you know, hey, I could let you take the swimming skill and the aqualung augmentation, or I could give you a biomod for the sequel that is called Swimmer or whatever, and it, it has both built into it. And they're mechanically the same. This one gives you plus 50% breath capacity, and it lets you swim 30% faster at the max level. This biomod could do both of those things, it's fine. But it wasn't the same to the user. The user wanted the fantasy of thinking, I am the aquatic guy, therefore I'm going to take up these slots and these slots to be the aquatic guy in combination. Even though me mechanically, economically, it's the same, in the fantasy, it, it's different. And so, basically, hindsight is twenty twenty. you know? The console limitations also harmed the environment design. With only 64 megabytes of RAM to work with, Ion Storm was forced to significantly reduce the scope of the levels from the original to only a fraction of the size. Whereas the original Deus Ex routinely had maps the size of multiple city blocks, Invisible War had to section off its world with painfully long, intrusive loading screens every couple of minutes. And instead of complex layered maps with many different paths, Invisible War often featured, say, a main entrance and a single air duct off to the side. Invisible War isn't a terrible game. If it hadn't followed up one of the greatest games of all time, it might even be somewhat fondly remembered, but it simply does not do justice to the original. Invisible War was released in 2003 to moderate critical praise and decent sales, but it also signaled what appeared to be the end for the series, at least to the public. 
Internally, IDOS immediately began developing pitches for further Deus Ex games. Art Min, a programmer on Invisible War, was given the lead of the sequel project, known internally as Deus Ex Insurrection. Warren Spector provided a number of possible directions for the project, including a Black Ops pitch that took place between Deus Ex and Invisible War, casting the player as an American soldier hunting down Illuminati spies and restoring democracy. Another was a sequel to Invisible War, in which JC has successfully created a hive mind out of humanity via nanotechnology, only to be opposed by his brother Paul, who forms an offline resistance. Min went a different route. Insurrection was to be a prequel to both games, with players taking the role of Blake Denton, JC and Paul's clone father, and a spy for the US government. The game was to use the Invisible War engine, but avoid many of its mistakes. Larger levels were a major focus, and many of Invisible War's changes were rolled back, such as Universal Ammo. Insurrection would also feature a home base that players would revisit in between missions, where they could re-equip and visit with a team of NPCs whose reactions would change based on choices the player made out in the field. But Insurrection never made it to production. Its death knell was Warren Spector's decision to leave to open his own studio, Junction Point, which began work on the game Epic Mickey soon after. Another IDOS-owned studio, Crystal Dynamics, was working on a multiplayer-focused entry into the series called Deus Ex Clan Wars. But after Invisible War failed to meet sales expectations, the decision was made to rebrand it as an original IP and distance it from Deus Ex. All references to Deus Ex were removed and the game was renamed Project Snowblind. Just one more sign that the franchise was dead in the water. IDOS gave it one more shot. Jordan Thomas led a team that developed an alternate pitch to Insurrection one that became the de facto Deus Ex 3 when Insurrection was cancelled. Thomas had become a rising star in the company due to his work on the famous Shale Bridge Cradle level in Thief Deadly Shadows. Deus Ex would also have cast you as J.C. Denton's father, only this time you would be an abandoned genetic experiment, a Frankenstein's monster of cybernetic augmentations, cast out of society and left with no choice but to pursue mercenary work. That work would have come in the form of randomized, procedurally generated missions, one pillar of Thomas's design was that any character, including major NPCs, be killable. But Thomas and his team never got the chance to pursue their vision, as IDOS finally shuttered Ion Storm in 2005, taking all of the various plans for Deus Ex 3 with it. Only a couple of years later, in 2007, seemingly out of nowhere, IDOS Interactive announced the creation of a new studio out of Montreal, appropriately named IDOS Montreal. The studio culled several experienced developers from nearby Ubisoft Montreal, bringing with them experience with series like Splinter Cell, Far Cry, and Prince of Persia. Their first project would not be a small or simple affair. They hit the ground running, and in November 2007, they announced their first project. While the team was made of experienced developers, none of them had worked on the previous Deus Ex games, nor did they have any connection to the Looking Glass or Ion Storm heritage. And now they would be tackling a sequel to a seemingly untouchable classic, one that had been plagued by a poorly received sequel and numerous cancellations. Without any directives from IDOS on how to approach the game, a small core team led by former Far Cry designer Jean-Francois Dugas set about creating a solid foundation for their sequel. They began by creating a self-contained set of references for the core teams to work from. They read the same books, watched the same movies, and played the same games and tabletop RPGs together so that they were working from the same influences. They also played the first game extensively, and put a fresh set of eyes onto what they felt worked and what did not, developing a structured critique of the game. They settled on making a prequel to the original, allowing them to stay true to the core values of the series, appealing to fans of the previous games, while also doing a soft reboot that would ease in a new generation of players. Having a recognizable, relatable near-future setting was important, and the 2020s allowed them to keep the game more grounded, closer to today's world than the far-flung future of Invisible War. Deus Ex Human Revolution cast players as Adam Jensen, security chief for the Detroit-based biotech firm Seraph Industries. The game opens with a terrorist attack on Seraph HQ that kills much of the team responsible for an upcoming breakthrough in human augmentation, including Adam's girlfriend and chief engineer, Megan Reed. The attack leaves Adam severely injured and inches from death. Seraph makes the call to save Adam by giving him significant mechanical augmentations. After his recovery, the newly augmented Adam dives into an investigation into the attacks on Seraph, which leads him from Detroit to Hangzhou, China, and even Montreal itself. One of the biggest breakthroughs for Human Revolution was the concept of the Cyber Renaissance, the idea that the 2020s was a period of unparalleled technological advancement, and that the sense of potential and creativity was comparable to the Italian Renaissance. 
the Renaissance themes worked their way into the narrative and art design. Unlike Deus Ex 1, where the world had been in shambles for decades, this is a world that has experienced massive change very quickly, and just as many people are terrified of that change as are excited. Everything from costume design to the architecture and the now iconic black and gold color scheme were developed by balancing cyberpunk aesthetics with Renaissance influence. Along those lines, the transhumanist themes that have always been present in the series were made the primary focus. Augmentations are new to the world in the 2020s, and society is struggling to decide where mechanical augmentation fits into their world. The result is a story that feels very much part of the Deus Ex lineage, but actually manages to ask bigger questions and make more pointed commentary about society than either previous game. Eidos Montreal also broke down the old game systems and rebuilt them from the ground up using modern reference points like Chronicles of Riddick, Rainbow Six Vegas, and Mass Effect. A cover system was added and the stealth mechanics were made more concrete and observable, with more feedback for the player regarding their visibility as well as the enemy's current state of mind. Augmentations were designed so that each one felt like a major new unlock giving players a radical new ability, like being able to punch through walls or fall from any height without taking damage rather than slight upgrades to existing abilities. Combat was a major focus as well. In the previous games, combat had always been a viable tactic, but it had felt somewhat marginalized, as if the game was shaming you for not choosing stealth. The team at Eidos Montreal spent a good portion of their time making sure that Human Revolution was a solid shooter, alongside the stealth and hacking gameplay. A social boss battle mechanic was added, forcing players to navigate dialogue trees while reading NPCs' tone of voice and facial expressions in order to push them towards a certain outcome. More than ever, this felt like a realization of Spectre's pitch for Troubleshooter. Talking a hostage taker out of letting his victims go, for example. Hacking also received a major upgrade. Rather than being represented as a simple loading bar, hacking was now a full minigame that involved conquering data nodes on an abstract map while security systems attempted to hack the trace back to the source and kick you out. Best of all, Human Revolution returned to the huge open-ended maps of the original game. The hub areas of Detroit and Hangshaw are large and dense, full of optional areas to explore and side quests to tackle. The missions often take place in huge facilities that gently nudge you toward the objective while giving you plenty of room to explore, rewarding that exploration with alternative routes, experience points, and extra bits of narrative. One major criticism of the game was the lack of said choice in the boss battles, which generally require head-on combat rather than allowing for the alternate approaches the series is known for, meaning that players who had chosen augs that favored hacking and stealth were at a major disadvantage. For a game that so faithfully adheres to the original Deus Ex design pillars, this was a glaring misstep. According to Dugas, this was due to the fact that the boss battles were outsourced to an outside development team when it became clear that the team wouldn't have time to get them all finished. Thankfully, the boss battles were reworked in the eventual director's cut re-release of the game to accommodate other playstyles. In the end, Human Revolution was remarkably successful at recapturing the Deus Ex magic. It didn't have a lot going for it. The frosty reception of Invisible War had caused fans to hold the original game in even higher regard, viewing it through rose-tinted glasses as a flawless masterpiece. Few would have thought that an unproven team with no connection to Warren Spector or Harvey Smith could have made a worthy sequel, let alone one that improves on the original in substantial ways, but Eidos Montreal did it. Human Revolution nails all of the original's most beloved features. A huge world that gives players freedom of choice and rewards exploration, a smart science fiction story that feels grounded in real-world issues, and, most importantly, cool trench coat dudes and air ducts. Upon release in 2011, critics and fans agreed that Human Revolution was an incredible game, and finally a worthy successor to the original. And by selling over 2 million copies by the end of its first year, the Deus Ex series finally had its first blockbuster hit. It should be no surprise then that Eidos Montreal jumped immediately into development on a sequel. The first direct sequel in the series, Deus Ex Mankind Divided takes place in 2029, only two years after the events of Human Revolution. Players once again control Adam Jensen, who is now working for Interpol while also joining forces with an underground hacker collective who are seeking to topple the Illuminati. The nascent division between those with and without augmentations has continued to grow, with Augs being shunned by society and forced into massive ghettos. Mankind Divided looks to stay pretty close to the formula established in Human Revolution, but time will tell if it brings any major changes to the series. 
Deus Ex has never been a franchise on the forefront of graphical technology, but with a new engine based on IO Interactive's Glacier tech used in Hitman, it's finally going to be pretty damn close. With a leap in graphical fidelity and a team with a proven track record, Mankind Divided looks to be a worthy follow-up. With the team at Eidos Montreal in charge, the Deus Ex series has been revitalized and remains in good hands. And in fact, the Looking Glass in Ion Storm Legacy is healthier than ever. Ken Levine went on to create the wildly successful Bioshock franchise before eventually shutting down Irrational Games and moving on to smaller, as yet unannounced projects. Doug Church now works at Valve, doing whatever it is people do when they work at Valve. Harvey Smith moved on from Ion Storm and eventually helped found Arcane Studios, leading development on the acclaimed Dishonored series, which shares several design sensibilities with Deus Ex. Warren Spector left Junction Point to teach at the University of Texas for several years, before being drawn back into game development in order to join back up with many of his old Looking Glass colleagues at Paul Neurath's new studio, Other Side Entertainment, where he will work on follow-ups to both Ultima Underworld and System Shock. And with an HD remake of System Shock also in development, it's safe to say that the future is bright for both future innovation and nostalgic revivalism in the immersive sim genre. Games often seem to choose between open-ended systems-based gameplay or a focused narrative experience, and those that try to offer both often stumble in the process. Yet the path that was first forged at Origin Systems and matured with Looking Glass Studios shows that there is a way to tell a great story while giving the player a sense of ownership and freedom within it. And even 16 years later, Deus Ex remains the very best example of that method. So why are you still listening to me? Why haven't you reinstalled it yet? Paul's getting lonely waiting on that dock.